Hi, this is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is award-winning author Rachel Simon, whose books include the New York Times best-selling novel, The Story of Beautiful Girl, and her life-affirming memoir, Riding the Bus with My Sister. This unpublished conversation was originally recorded October 13, 2010. Hi, Rachel, and welcome to Family Confidential. Hi, Annie. It's great to be here. Well, it's great for me to finally be talking to you because you and I met on Twitter, and we've been email pals for a while, and I've been enjoying your books so much. I even saw the movie a couple of weeks ago of Riding the Bus with My Sister, and I kind of feel like I know you a little bit. (laughs) And and I'm thinking you, you probably get that a lot since you write memoirs. Yes, actually, I do. Um, And it's interesting because I have switched back to fiction, which is where I started my writing career. Uh, So I'm wondering when the next book comes out, which is a novel, if if the same kind of thing is going to happen. But one of the uh, unexpected benefits of writing memoir that no one actually ever talks about is the joy of meeting people who've read it, who really do know you and so that um, moat that you have to cross over that normally exists between you and another person where you don't know each other and you got to sort of figure out when to trust and where to trust and what you can say that just disappears there's no moat and so people can just talk to me and tell me about themselves because there's already a trust level it's really a wonderful thing so it's been really really nice how cool is that (laughs) it's really cool well you know this whole thing about communication and trust I think is um, paramount to your story about riding the bus with your sister and the fact that you entered into her world and the two of you really I think rehabilitated a trust bond that you had had when you were very young that had um, for whatever reason fallen along the wayside and by seeing her ability to connect with people through her rides on the bus those moving communities it just seemed to me like a wonderful way to get to know someone familiar from a new point of view you're an astute reader and uh if you had been my life advisor at the time when i decided to start writing with my sister I might have had the perceptiveness to realize you were being astute, and yet I might have resisted nonetheless, <laughs> because when you're not getting along with someone who has been close to you, whether that's a family member or a friend, to think of doing something like immerse yourself in their world can be a very formidable thing to, to consider. And certainly uh, something as unusual as riding buses all day long was really not on my list of things to do in my life. So I, as you know, was resistant to doing this at the beginning and then pretty much just had to decide on the spot to go ahead and do it. I love the way Beth, your sister, kind of um, challenged you to do it for a year. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And she also, I don't think she did it deliberately, but she asked me to do it as a bus was coming. (laughs) To be fair to your listeners, I had already spent one day on the bus with her prior to uh, her presenting this to me at such a critical uh, moment. And I had done that because an editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, for whom I'd been doing freelance commentary, found out what my sister did and and said, uh, it's really fascinating, which I actually didn't really know all that much about. I just was... um, I objected to it but without really understanding it. I thought it was very strange that she spent all of her time on buses and I wanted her to do something more productive with her life. And so he uh, said, have you ever ridden with her? And I said, no. And he said, well, why not? And the real answer, of course, was because I'm judging her. Mm -hmm. But when we're judging someone, we don't know we're judging them. And it's, it's such a key to coming close to someone who you've drifted away from is to recognize where your judgments are pushing you apart from them. Yes. And the way to realize it is to realize you are judging them, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's like the first step to stopping drinking is to realize that you are powerless over your problem. And, and I was powerless over my problem of recognizing that, that I was judging my sister 
So I actually had no answer for him when he said, well, why don't why you do it? <laughs> right. And instead, he said, your next assignment is to ride with her for a day and write about it. And that's what broke the ice initially. Well, this is so interesting. And you know, I'm often thinking about the patterns we get into with our family members, people we're closest with from birth or people that we're thrown together with or choose in a friendship and it gets habituated, those patterns that are not as welcoming and accepting, or as you say, can be judgmental. And how to break through those is a, is a huge challenge for all of us who are on any kind of path towards, I don't know, um, <laughs> enlightened living or just more self-awareness so that we can be kinder to other people and more respectful and all of that stuff. And I think it's what, what I just picked up from what you said is that idea of objecting to something without really understanding it. I think that's, that's a pretty much... Uh, pretty much an accurate statement of what we all do, most of it subconsciously or unconsciously, when we see someone walk by the street and for some reason they don't measure up to our standards of what is okay. And so without any further ado, the, the critic within us is immediately dismissing them. Yes. Yeah, and, and you talk about some of the passengers on the bus with Beth and how they don't get her, don't understand her, and immediately go to that place of dismissal. It's true. And I actually see people do this with everyone. I see them do it with family members, friends, strangers, and certainly our political discourse is um, very poisoned by quick, shallow judgment my next book, I which had two names, one in hardback and one in paperback, but the paperback name is The House on Teacher's Lane. Which I read and adored. So and thank you. you. <laughs> and I uh, very much appreciate the kind things you've said about it. For that one, um, among the worlds I entered were my husband's world. He's an architect, and I didn't really know how all of that operated, other than him telling me about it, but to actually be in it with him was a very different experience and also from uh, realizing the importance of immersing myself in other people's lives. I entered the contractor's life and tried to get to know my mother better mm -hmm. by way of understanding her affection for lighthouses. And you may remember in that book, I make reference to uh, a man who has Asperger's syndrome named William Stillman, who does this wonderful seminar called Demystifying the Autistic Experience. And in it, he talks about how if another person has a passion and you don't understand that person, which often happens when a family member has autism or some kind of disability, that the best way to get close to them is to enter their passion rather than stand outside it and criticize it. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to have studied anthropology in college and I remember at the time when I fell in love with anthropology thinking, oh, this is the key to empathy. This is the key to cultures getting along. This is the key to peace because you really learn, okay, I'm going to enter some, someone else's culture and see what they do and why they do it and what they don't like about it and come to just embrace them as, as a whole being or a whole culture. And it, yet, in spite of studying it, it took me 25 years to learn to apply that in my own life and to apply it to the individuals in my life, uh, starting with my sister and her bus riding and then moving on from there to other people. But I just wish everybody who's listening to this would consider doing that with the people they're feeling distant from uh, and don't want to feel distant from. It's so hard. I mean, just making that decision, I'm going to enter into, I'm going to cross the line and enter into their world. I think you're already halfway there to compassion and understanding because you've got that willing spirit to do that. But what I'm always asking myself about my own behavior and about the greater culture is why the resistance to saying, I would like to understand that person better. What What is that? What, you got any take on that one? I do. Uh, yeah, because obviously I think about this a great deal. Um, I think we, I, I use, I guess, a couple different terms for this, but it amounts to the same thing. Pride. De define pride for me in the way you're using it. Pride. The way I look at things, the way I do things is the right way. The right way. And other ways are lesser than. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and I also see ego, which one can look at these as essentially synonyms, as being the same. And I see ego come out, um, I teach writing privately, I, I used to teach it on the college level, now I teach it privately. And the number one impediment to people uh, who want to write, actually writing, <laughs> is not that they lack the time, and it's not that they lack the skills, though those things may be true, but they can be overcome. The number one impediment is their ego. And by their ego, I don't mean healthy self-esteem. I mean, they are thinking so much about themselves, and in particular, how they think other people will think about them, that they can't actually focus on the work at hand. So they're kind of looking at their social standing and, you know, well, if I write this and it, it isn't very good, will someone think I'm dumb? Will my mother realize that I still harbor that same anger for her I had when I was 12? Will... Will the nun who put me down in front of a classroom when I was nine for a poem I wrote actually be proven to be right, even though I'm now 45? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's being very involved with what you think other people think of you, rather than saying, who cares what other people think of me? I need to open myself up to other people. It's, it's opening the mind and the heart and disregarding how one is viewed socially in order to do that. I think if you look at the great thinkers in history and in religion, that's for the most part what they've done. They've said, I, I must open my mind and my heart, and I must not think about the fact that um, doing so may make other people think less of me um, because what they think of me isn't as important as me embracing others. This is all so interesting in light of Beth's quote unquote disability. Yes. <laughs> because one thing I really got from her is a certain joie de vivre where she is, this is who I am. <laughs> I like to wear orange. <laughs> I like to do this kind of stuff. And she really didn't have that pride barrier that many of us have that hold us back and shut us up. In, in ways that I think diminish our spirits. Yes, that's true, uh, particularly when it's something she really wants to do. Now, mm -hmm. I do need to add, as, as a sister mm -hmm. um, and as someone who knows an awful lot of siblings, when it's something she doesn't want to do, <laughs> her pride may come into play. Mm -hmm. uh, you may remember we had an argument, one of a, a ridiculous argument, but it's an argument I reproduced in the book, where we're walking down the street, and I said, uh, where are we? Yes, it was the corner. And I say, well, we can't be at the corner of whatever it was, you know, 10th and Main, because we're not at a corner. We're on the street. We're between corners. Uh -huh. And we got in this just huge fight because she wouldn't acknowledge that being you on the street. That you were right. She wouldn't acknowledge that you were right. That's how I was viewing it. Yeah. But of course, <laughs> what she comes to at the end of it is what difference does it make? I get where I want to get. Yes. And I think to be to be fair to family members, this can be a very hard moment when you perceive that your family member can get a concept, um, but is choosing not to. Mm -hmm. So the way I've tried to reframe it for myself is to look at the concepts Beth wants to know and to go with them. And when she resists getting a concept that I think she can get to just drop it because it's not going to do any good. And it, perhaps part of that's being siblings is, you know, how siblings, you know, how to press each other's buttons. And mm -hmm. so, you know, she might get into knowing she's riling me up, which is just going to make her dig in her heels all the more, yes. uh, which was something we do as humans. But instead for me to say to myself, all right, I'm just, I'm not going to go there. I'm, I'm going to remove my pride from this situation uh, I should also add that I see pride and ego and righteousness being very tied up together. Yes, I do too. Yes. So I, I'm thinking that you can't have a fight if one person withdraws their pride. <laughs> that is really true. And I think anyone who's been in a happy marriage mm -hmm. knows that, mm -hmm. that you have to put the unity of of the pair over one sanctimoniousness. Mm -hmm. So being right, you know, the old saying, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? 
<laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think that that need to be right is maybe I don't know. Say it's inborn. The need to be right versus the the desire to cooperate. I'm not really sure about that, so I'll leave that hanging for a minute. But I do want to, since most of my listeners are parents, I want to ask you something because I'm I'm interested in how it felt for you growing up in a family with a sibling who had special needs, and the feeling that maybe more than Beth's share of parental attention that was she got more than her share which might have left if you thought it was a finite if love is a finite thing that you got less than your share because I I do get emails from kids frequently when for for some reason or another there is a sibling maybe a sibling with special needs maybe maybe a sibling who is chronically ill or is for for some reason all the attention from parents seem to be going to that child, and the child who's writing to me is feeling left out, not good enough, um, competitive, jealous, all of those things. And so I'm wondering, speaking to a group of parents, what your experience was as that child and how you see it maybe now as an adult. Big question. Yeah, it's a really big question. Um, My experience was a little different from some siblings who uh, have those feelings very intensely. As you know, I do a lot of public speaking around the country and speak to a lot of people in the disability community, and I've met a lot of siblings and parents, obviously. And um, what I found is that the hardest sibling dynamic is where there's only one other sibling. Mm Mm-hmm. So it really feels like, wait a minute, why can't it be 50-50? Why does it have to be 70-30 or Mm -hmm. 90-10 with me having no choice in what I do? So it's not only the disproportionate energies going toward the family member with the extra needs. It's also feeling a removal of whatever freedom Um, a more typical child in a more typical situation might be given to chart the course of her own life, uh, both in a day-to-day basis and over the long haul. And those siblings, when I meet only other siblings, um, they often have a lot of uh, anger and resentment that's pretty intense and it can go well into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's It was different for me because there were two other siblings, Mm -hmm. and at different times, different ones of us took more of the responsibility, but there wasn't the feeling of, oh, it's all going to fall on me, because there was the sense that we didn't know which one it was going to fall on when we were growing up. Um, There were a couple of additional factors, and, and one is a very key one. I was interviewed a few years ago by uh, Dr. Dan Gottlieb in Philadelphia, who's a radio psychotherapist and had quadriplegia for 30 years now. And he said to me, if I could go back into my childhood and change anything about how my parents dealt with Beth's disability, what would it be? Mm, Great question. It was a great question. One thing that happened in my family, which does happen in a lot of families, is my parents got divorced. And so my father wasn't part of the family for a while, and my mother was the single parent, which was very difficult. But the thing that I would have changed once that happened was that my mother had taken better care of herself because she didn't. She Mm. did not join support groups. She wasn't someone who had friends. She just she just wasn't someone like that. We barely belonged to our synagogue. So she just didn't have social supports. She, she didn't have emotional resources. She didn't have what you needed. Um, and so as the years went by, she increasingly fell apart. And her falling apart actually became the dominant force in the family larger than Beth's disability. Hmm. And it's really interesting when writing the bus came out and several of my childhood friends read it because I tend to stay in touch with everyone. (laughs) Um, So, you know, friends from nursery school and third grade (laughs) and everything were reading it and they'd say, I just never realized you were going through this with Beth. I thought the issue was your mother. (laughs) Um, So I think one of the key things and siblings know the siblings talk about this in the sibling community. Um, which I'll get to in a minute, Um, we talk about how the experience that siblings have with their 
family member with special needs and also in dealing with the larger community in terms of that family member, it is so charted by how the parents are and not just how the parents are dealing with the, the typical individual and not just how the parents are dealing with the individual with special needs, but how the parents are dealing with themselves mm-hmm. and are they using other people essentially to help themselves cope Um, My mother did that. The way she did that was not through using us. She wanted to find a man to sweep her off her feet and rescue her. So she just threw caution to the winds and dated um, men not worthy of her or us, uh, leading to a real horrible crisis that I will skip, but that left a very black mark on the family. Um, But I go into in my books. Uh, (laughs) And yeah, (laughs) and and so I think that when parents think, you know, what can I do and how do I give the typical sibling more attention, that's actually not r- really the only question. Uh, remember that families are kind of organisms. You know, you're, it's not that each person is alone. Each person exists in relationship to everyone else in the family, and everyone has to be attended to. Um, that said, if I may address it from the sibling perspective, a, a lot of siblings struggle with a lot of feelings, and included with these feelings are, are feelings of love toward the family member with the disability and empathy and sense of responsibility and uh, a much greater maturity than your peers because you know it could happen to you mm-hmm. instead of them, and you know it could happen to the neighbor next door, but it happened to your house. I mean, the image I used to have in the when my parents were still together until I was eight was, uh, and we lived in a nice suburban block and everything. And my image was that lightning happened to have struck a house on our block and the house it struck was ours. And that when it struck, it happened to have hit my sister's bedroom, not Mm -hmm. mine. And that's why I had to take care of her. And that's why the rest of the block should help us. Mm -hmm. And that's remained my picture of society. And I, I, think that that is the way a lot of siblings feel in conjunction with anger, resentment, guilt, uh, fear, frustration with outsiders who don't get it, maybe embarrassment, you know. But there's also this just strong understanding of the reality of human frailty and the importance of collective responsibility. So I think siblings are different from other members of the family, it's real important to recognize this particular distinction. Siblings, everything I just described to you about being a sibling, siblings grow up with. Siblings didn't have a before. There mm-hmm. wasn't a time when you didn't have this as your view of the universe. This, this is your view of the universe, whereas parents transition in and may, in fact, have a grieving period. Siblings don't have that. So in a way, it's purer and easier. And yet, because it's not acknowledged as a social identity, it can also be harder. You tend to get shut out of the information loop. You may have to hear people at school using, you know, incredibly derogatory, horrible words in your company, having the fantasy that just because you don't look like someone with a disability, that you don't love someone with a disability. So as part of all this, what should a sibling do? What can a sibling do? And I think there's a few key things. Uh, One is join the sibling community. Because I had two other typical siblings, in a way we had our own sibling community. Nonetheless, I was still always looking for people who were like me. And I, I I remember every instance, and there were only a handful, when I encountered people who had a family member with a disability and really wanting to start a, a dialogue and them resisting. And I think that had to do with their family's approach to the disability, which was, we don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Whereas so, in my family, we did. Right. So when you say that you would absolutely encourage people, kids, or young adults, or even fully grown adults who are dealing with this to find others like them and join the sibling community. This was a term I had not heard until I started researching you and the work that you do. Is um, the How large is the sibling community, and what kind of resources are out there for the sibling community? Well, there's two key places where people can go, and I don't know if you will put these links Absolutely. online. Um, The the Sibling Support Project, which is based in Seattle, but is international in its reach. Mm -hmm. And the man at the center of it is named Don Meyer. He is tireless. 
He is magnetic. He is one of the most dynamic speakers you will ever encounter. Um, he has started the whole concept of sib shops, which are for school-age kids who are siblings to talk honestly about their feelings. He's also got some listservs for both school-age and adults who are siblings. And he's just completely core to the sibling community. The website will have all these resources, ways to connect with other siblings, uh, books about siblings. So the Sibling Support Project. So that would be sort of your first stop Mm -hmm. to start networking into the sibling community. And then the second stop would be something called the Sibling uh, Leadership Network. They are very new and they come from the Sibling Support Project and are siblings who started to feel that they wanted to have a political voice. And so they got involved with what are lists of things we want every parent to know? What are lists of things that we think policymakers need to know? to consider when they are making public policy. Mm -hmm. So, and they're very active as well. They're a little bit more involved, a little less involved in sort of the warm and fuzzy, you know, emotional, share your feeling stuff and and more involved with how do we change the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, But both together, I think will really not only empower siblings, but just really make you feel like you're not alone. You're having an experience that, is different from most other people you know, and yet millions and millions and millions of people in this world share it with you, and you look in their eyes and you will see yourself. And it certainly seems like an experience that is rich with opportunities for learning. Yeah, although it's funny because I think parents tend to phrase it in those terms more than a sibling does. Because remember, we didn't have it before. So there's... It's not like, well, yeah, I can learn from this. It's this is my life. Am I going to get the most out of it despite some what sometimes might be very strong feelings or the impulse to run away? Um, wh- what am I going to do with this? This is this is the hand I'm dealt. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do with it? Whereas I think, you know, parents, you can go, oh, wow. OK, the hand I was dealt just changed. How do I learn from it? See, it's a, it's a real different thought process. Right. That, that's good. Thank you for the distinction. The idea of, of teasing in middle school is something that, you know, I, I work with parents, teachers, and students around bullying, teasing, peer harassment kinds of issues. And the kinds of names that people are called in the halls, in the lunchroom, and the kind of language that's thrown around, I can only imagine what it must feel like, as you say, to love someone with a disability and hear these insensitive words being thrown around. It's it's very hard knowing what the social pressure is in the snake pit that we call middle school to stand up and do the right thing. Yes. And I, I remember a scene in in your book where you're coming home on the bus and Beth is meeting you curbside in front of your house and her unbridled joy in seeing you and your embarrassment because of the teasing you got from the kids who were on the bus. Oh yeah. I knew that I knew you were going to bring that scene up. Uh, It's excruciating even now to remember that. And I knew that my embarrassment, you know, they were all laughing at her, this whole Mm -hmm. school bus. Mm-hmm. And I knew my embarrassment was about them and not her. And yet the only way I could think to deal with it was to say to her, don't wait for me outside the house. Yeah. And I knew she wasn't going to listen to that. And um, I tried to talk to my mother about it. And she insistently was not going to listen to that because it was very important to her that Beth be a regular person and, you know, not be hidden in the attic kind of thing. One of the fascinating things about being a sibling that I did not understand until middle age, really, is that you know very naturally how to inhabit two different worlds simultaneously that don't acknowledge each other. So you can inhabit the world of disabilities and the typical world equally and equally easily and go back and forth between the two. And in fact, you're, you're viewed as the messenger between the two. But one of those worlds may not see the other, and we can pretty easily say which one that is. And yet you can be in both at the same time and kind of deal with the fact that one isn't seeing the other 
uh, and do so with a plum because you just know how to do it. And at the same time, to take it back to this incident, I was furious and, and ashamed and horrified at the situation. And yet, simultaneously, of course, I knew my mother was right. She was of right. Of course, I knew she was right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So what you're dealing with as a sibling, you to get back to righteousness earlier, you know you're right. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, the force of society works against this. And you are constantly David facing Goliath. That is constantly what you're doing. The thing about getting older as a sibling is you realize that as horrible as it is to be in that position, that you were always in that position and that you kind of know how to be in that position and you know how to keep fighting even when you don't want to. And you may make choices that... Um, you'd have to make for the situation like I stopped riding the school bus. Uh, that was the choice I, I felt I had to make to deal with it. But it didn't make me love my sister less. Mm-hmm. It just made me avoid those bullies more. Mm-hmm. And that was a choice I made. Um, I think another related choice is just accepting I'm not going to be popular. I don't care if I'm popular. I don't <laughs> want to be popular with those people. And my sister's not popular and she's pretty happy. So why do I have to be popular? So you're, you're, you're really, being a sibling means you've completely changed the equation. There will be things you're not happy about, but you're kind of used to it at the same time. It's your life. It's your, it, it is your life. It is who you are. Yeah. Wow. I could talk to you for a long time. Because <laughs> this is, you know, this is sibling disability specific, and it's not. <laughs> That's right. And that's what's so fascinating about this, because this stuff here for all of us to aspire to in terms of our behavior towards other people. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting how that works. And I think if you really talk to any sibling you know, you'll if you're not one, you'll get a perspective on life that's a lot wiser and more insightful than most people you know, if, if you let them speak honestly. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm hoping when we post this podcast, um, there will be lots of opportunities for people to post comments in response to it, and that we'll hear some of the voices of siblings. And um, that would that, be great. That would be great. That would really be great. My guest today has been Rachel Simon, author of Riding the Bus with My Sister and The House on Teacher's Lane. Rachel, before we close, I'm wondering if you might tell our listeners where they might find out more about you, um, your upcoming book, where you're speaking, and any information that you want to put out there. Oh, thanks. That's really nice of you. Um, My website is www.rachelsimon.com. Pretty simple. Um, I have information about all my books there, although I haven't yet put up information about my new book. It's called The Story of Beautiful Girl, not The Beautiful Girl, Beautiful Girl. And it is about two adults who have disabilities who are in love and a missing baby. Um, And I won't explain the connection there, but it is a close connection. And it follows the storyline of these people for 40 years Um, as they struggle to come back together and be the family they should have been at the beginning. Uh, And in doing so, it pretty much covers the whole disability experience. It covers siblings. It covers parents. And um, some of the sad truths about our history in America with how we have treated people with disabilities and why we need not to be doing that anymore. It's uh, it's hard to imagine a more anti-bullying book than um, than the story of Beautiful Girl. Thanks again for your time, Rachel. I really appreciate your being here with us. Thanks a lot. Ride the bus. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Bye. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, visit AnnieFox.com. There you can check out my parenting book, Teaching Kids to Be Good People, Progressive Parenting for the 21st Century. And please tune in next week when my guest will be filmmaker Tiffany Schlein, who was honored by Newsweek as one of the women shaping the 21st century. Tiffany and I will be talking about Technology Shabbat, a weekly respite from the Internet. Yes, a plan for unplugging from digital media so you can plug into your family. Till then, happy parenting! 